In the last video, we talked about sorting out the different spaces in your garden, deciding on your master plan, and that is crucial. And so when you've got your different spaces, you will have your boundaries. You will have your external boundary that divides your garden or separates your garden from Joe Bloggs next door, or maybe a road or the fields. And more importantly, or definitely as importantly, you have your internal boundaries and they will divide one space of your garden from another. And I always think you need to decide with those internal and external boundaries what sort of boundary you want. Do you want it above eye level because you're masking something ghastly the other side or you want to focus your eye onto something nicer? Do you want it below eye level, maybe on the ground or just very low? Or do you want a see-through boundary? And then once you've decided how you want your boundary to function, in what capacity, then of course you come to the exciting part and you can decide upon the materials. This is often the case when you want to hide your neighbour or you want to hide something hideous and high that he's got. And why often when I'm trying to decide how high that boundary needs to be to screen the offending object is I'll get a staff, a pole of some sort, a cane, and I'll get the client to go upstairs, to go downstairs, outside to the places they use most, and just see with a, with a staff, with a line at different heights, and just see how high we need to take that boundary. It sounds pedantic, but really you want to get away with the lowest structure you can, because if you're building a wall, it costs a lot of money if it's high. If you're planting plants, if you have something that's going to grow massively high, it's going to be quite a job to clip it or maintain it. So you want to make sure it's just the minimum height you need to blot out the eyesore. People often plant hedges and then they just get too high, they get out of control. And because they are so relieved when they block out the offending object, as they get higher and higher and higher, they just actually make the garden too dark, they take up too much light, they can offend the neighbours, they're a pain to cut at a high level. Get out the ladders, you know, some people even bring in these tower lifts to cut them from. So really you want to make sure you have them the absolute minimum height that you need. And when you are actually trying to obscure things that are high, you can use other techniques to help you get that height. Of course, you could just put a tree in and wait for it to grow. But if you want to be more impatient and you want it instant, then you might think about changing levels. You might think about actually making the level along your boundary quite high. And this might be by taking earth from somewhere else and building up a bund, which I've often done, or it might be by just putting your trees on the boundary in big baseless containers, or in effect a raised bed with no base along the boundary. So if you have something a metre high and you plant it in, in a structure a metre high, you immediately have gained a metre. And so that can be really quite an inexpensive thing to do because it just could be something like plywood or steel, a bit of sheet steel, and then you could actually hide it with a low hedge in front. Um, so there are ways and means. You don't have to have a massive budget in order to cheat it and get that plant higher. When you came up our drive when we first bought the property, there were no gates between us and the adjoining farmyard. And I used there a type of screening which I've seen at, I saw at Fairside Palace, which sounds very grand, but they had used it to screen the compost areas and all the things that you never see when you visit Fairside Palace. But because I was sort of sniffing around, I did pick up on it. And what they did is they used chestnut picket fencing, which is sort of triangular chestnut rails and they put them very close together. So there was just a very minimal gap. So you couldn't really see through it unless you put your eye through it and saw what was behind, which I did. And then they painted it a very dark green color. And the tops of the fence had had one short at one higher, one short at one higher, a sort of staggered top, which is quite a common way that you do a picket or a palisade fence to add more interest. And they'd added nice finials because it was Fairside Palace, let's face it. But since then, I've used that detail in lots of gardens, in town gardens and country gardens, when I want to have a camouflage boundary that's in a sort of woodland setting. Um, and I copied it on my own drive, but I didn't bother to paint the gates. But that's a nice sort of rustic 
boundary and because it's not solid it doesn't have to be so strong so when you make a solid boundary or a solid gate when you open them if they're big and the wind takes you it really does force it open so it can be quite difficult to open a solid gate and a solid fence has to be pretty strong to withstand the power of gale and gusts that we often get um, but when you put the gap in it it can filter the wind and so it is much better it doesn't have to be so strong structurally from that point of view this wonderful boundary designed by thomas hoblin for his chelsea garden is similar in principle but far more refined a perfect boundary to either screen or, in this case, entice. When you come to other boundaries, the see-through boundaries, um, behind me I've got my hedges and these were just, I could have just had a straight U hedge going across, but I quite liked it that I took the mouths out of it and made walkways through. So I've used these hedges because I wanted to break the garden up to make different interesting areas, but I also use them because I'm filtering the wind and they do a lot to filter the southwesterlies that come across the garden. But at the same time, I like the glimpses through, the glimpses this way to the veg garden, the glimpses that way to what is going to be the rose meadow and the walkway right the way through to the fields. So to my mind, I've got the best of both worlds. I've cut chunks out of them. I've made the chunks a slightly more interesting shape than you would normally see, but they're also nice and solid and it really does shelter me. I can hear the wind all around me now, but I can't feel it too much, which is great. And then the boundary along the edge of the terrace. Now that terrace we use all the time and you might not consider that a boundary, but it's a different type of garden. I've got the paved sitting area, the eating area, and then I've got the walkway down to the greenhouses and to the wall garden. And so the surfaces indicate there's a change of boundary. I've got gravel and paving there, grass here, but bigging it up further, I've got the pergola, which supports the awning, which sort of divides it up. And then I've got a mixture of topiary and U standards in containers, baseless containers, of course, because it's me. So that, in effect, forms a see-through boundary. And I like that because I love that part of the house. That is a view of the old 13th century part of the house with the windows sunken right down to ground level and the solar just above it. And I think that old part of the house with the buttresses is interesting. Um, it's not elegant, it's not beautiful, but it's old and interesting. And I love old and interesting. Another great type of see-through boundary that's used a lot, a trellis fencing. And I love trellis fencing because you can make it much more opaque, so you can put the battens really close together so you just get a glimpse of something else the other side, or you can make it much more open so the two spaces interact a bit more. And the other thing about trellis is it can be quite a focus and that you can paint it a bright standout colour that fits in with other parts of your garden. We've used mauve trellis because the client loved mauve in places. We've used a pale grey blue or you can use natural wood or you can use black. You can really do anything with it and because trellis isn't solid like wooden gates you can get away with much more interesting colour ranges on a trellis than you could on a solid hard surface. And trellis, you can scoop the tops, you can um, do finials, interesting finials on the tops. You can have it in many different variations to really ring the changes. So it does look quite unique to your garden, which is always nice when it's not just an off the peg trellis. And actually, I think it's much easier and cheaper to make yourself or have made for you yourself than the ones that are bought off the peg. I'm a great fan of using scrolls on my trellis and, and swooping up trellis, but obviously that's a detail that is more expensive, but I think it just adds interest. And when I'm doing trellis like that, I always use a very durable timber such as cedar, um, Western Red Cedar, which, which lasts a long time. Another technique or strategy I often use, um, in, particularly in small gardens, is I might do a pergola. And that actually defines the space very nicely, but you still see through it. But it very much makes one space very different from another. So I've done them with just a pergola, 
um, maybe with maybe formed of trellis and that often put big baseless pots with plants in in front of the pergola or beside it because again it makes it a softer more organic structure and I think when you do something quite hard like a pergola uh, to soften it up uh, in a way that it, it registers whatever the season um, such as using a plant in a baseless pot really helps make it really part garden, part structure. And I like that very fused part, that very fused way to use plants and structure. So you don't quite know whether it's soft or hard, it's both. And that makes it more interesting. And sometimes with a pergola, I might have built-in seats running along the back as well, um, which also form a type of boundary. But the seat with the back is a very usable boundary obviously and in a small space you want to use every piece of space that you've got and often I like to have gates and doors that are see-through so you've made them so you can see through the top and catch a glimpse you don't lose your privacy but it just tells you there's something else to go on to so I've got quite a few see-through gates here um, I've also got see-through gates that I've done on many many other garden schemes and I love doing see-through gates because you can change the design infinitely in many many different variations and so you can make each one unique. Um, I would, wouldn't want to use the same style in every garden I designed. I always want to make it slightly different and I never run out of ideas for see-through gates. Plants are extremely useful for see-through boundaries. You can use espalier trees, you can use any sort of trained fruit trees, you can use grasses. Then obviously grasses won't be there in the winter so much, but then people don't use the outside spaces so much in the winter. So bear in mind that a boundary, a planted boundary needn't be evergreen. It can work when it's at its peak in the summer months because that's when you're going to use the garden. So again, that's something that you need to factor in. When are we going to be wanting privacy? What times of the year? Does it have to be evergreen? Can it be deciduous? Could it be more ephemeral? Could it just be grasses um, and things like verbena bonariensis en masse and a bit of topiary? Living Willow makes a fantastic and inexpensive see-through boundary. It's tough, very fast growing, and it's very easy to train over any structure. And for a rustic effect, try dried willow with strips of woven oak. Elsewhere, where you've got a building that's being used for something quite private, so where we've got the spa at time, you've got people inside the building having treatments, wanting total peace and quiet and privacy. And then you've got people using a space nearby at quite high density. So we made a boundary there of plants that dissuades people from going in it, but it's not totally full of plants. So it, it just is almost like a maze of low and high plants and it looks attractive and it keeps people right away from the windows, which is what we want. And that is quite often the case when we're doing holiday cottages um, and you've got quite small gardens up together and when you've got a series of holiday cottages together, you want to keep people away from the windows. And that is a technique that I use quite often to have planting in gravel that's quite high density of different heights and it just keeps people away from the windows. And in Horatio's garden, we use the same technique to give patients rooms and wards more privacy from passers-by. We also planted internal boundaries to create a series of private outdoor rooms for patients and their visitors. So just consider what, how that boundary needs to work and then it helps you fine tune what you actually select to do the job in hand. Also, you can use your boundaries to deflect the noise. And if you've got neighbours next door and you're both sitting out on immediately adjacent terraces either side of your boundary, the noise can be just as obtrusive as the look. And if, you, if it really bothers you, obviously something like a brick wall is going to actually um, refract or reflect the sound, bounce it off much more than a hedge. A hedge actually won't change the noise factor at all. People think it does, but it's purely the psychological effect of you can't see it, so it doesn't seem so bad. You can now get wooden fences that are designed to be acoustic barriers. 
and you can even get ones that you can put up yourself and these fit together very tightly so you don't get gaps through which the sound waves can travel through but those are quite useful too so if noise is a problem consider going down that route too. Sometimes you might just have a very low boundary. So um, where we've got a wide sweeping terrace of a very grand or big house and it rolls out onto lawns, I've done a low box parterre. And that's really good because it, it separates the space, it defines it, but in no way does it occlude the beautiful rolling view down to the lake beyond and the capability landscape behind. Um, and so bear in mind that a boundary can be six foot high, ten foot high, or it can just be a few inches high. Roy Strong, when he had his lovely garden, he always said he wanted it inward looking because he didn't know what anyone of his neighbours might do and ruin his view. So he made his garden very, very inward looking purposely. But if you want to take the risk, and if you have perhaps control of your adjoining land, or maybe not, you can actually then have wonderful views onto surrounding landscape, particularly if it's a nice bit of pasture. And sometimes we've just actually put in a see-through fence, like an estate fence, onto some grazed pasture, and often we put in a dummy gate. Um, you don't have a right of way through the gate, but it makes it look as though you let your land goes way on beyond. This low level boundary not only discourages hotel guests from walking on the private lawn, but also allows the house owners to still soak up the magnificent surrounding views. Because this client's entrance had no boundaries, there were always cars parked by the front door. So we used pattern paving to create distinct ground level boundaries that completely discouraged any visitors from parking there. We also changed the levels using a stone retaining wall to create a large dining paved area and designed a box hedge parterre to liven up the new sloped boundary between terrace and lawn. To change the height of your boundary, to change the see-throughness of your boundary is all what makes a garden interesting and it gives you many variants. And so here, my very favourite boundary is no boundary at all. Obviously, a ha-ha is wonderful, but not everyone can put in a ha-ha. You can just cut the hedge, and I think that's lovely. You, you sculpt the boundary hedge, so it swoops down, and you have a very low bit or no bit in the middle. And that is lovely. And if there aren't grazing stock out there, then it really doesn't matter if you're just looking at a field of wheat or linseed or whatever. And I quite like the fact that you're looking out at a ploughed field in winter, perhaps, and then a mass of blue flowers if it's linseed in early summer, or waving heads of drying oat or something, oats or something like that. I, I just love seeing the, the seasonal changes in the countryside. I think um, it's just wonderful. And it's such a contrast between your garden and the surrounding landscape. And I always think contrast is very invigorating. In this tiny terrace garden, we dramatically transformed the existing concrete boundary using a Tom Loy and built a see-through banister boundary to create distinct areas within the space. So when you're planning your boundaries, just analyse exactly what you want them to do and try and think out of the box a bit. You can then go quite wacky, quite different, make it so it's something you've never seen before and just interpret what you need to have into a way that will really be functional and will look fantastic. <laughs>